Greetings all, Ferrariman601 here. After putting themselves on the sim racing map in an absolutely spectacular fashion, Race Sim Studio have decided to one-up themselves with this Formula Hybrid 2018. To understand the significance of this car, we first have to rewind the clock back 12 months to March of 2017. Formula One was all change in 2017. We had brand new aero regulations. The cars were going to be up to 5 seconds a lap faster. Nobody was really certain of the level of performance that we would see in real world Grand Prix racing, none the least us sim racers. However, one small team of modders, Race Sim Studio, decided to take up that challenge firsthand and design and release to the world an in-house from the ground up interpretation of the 2017 Formula One technical regulations. That was Formula Hybrid 2017. It was the first 2017 spec open wheeler to grace us in Aceto Corsa, and really at that time, nobody, as we said, had any idea of what to expect. Race Sim Studio, looking at the technical regulations, put together their own interpretation and designed a car around it, and they absolutely reset the standard in terms of mod quality in Aceto Corsa. They, once again, have decided to take up that challenge in 2018, and they have released this, Formula Hybrid 2018. Formula Hybrid 2017 was such a revolutionary car for Aceto Corsa because it was our first realistic look at the 2017 Formula One technical regulations from a first-hand perspective, and we got that car just after winter testing concluded in 2017, so really, it was our chance to get up to speed, literally and figuratively, with what Formula One was going to be doing that year, and I think the amount of learning that we were all able to do as sim racers was absolutely tremendous and unprecedented, thanks to the efforts of Race Sim Studio. Here for 2018, they have done exactly the same thing. This car is a fictional one. However, just like its predecessor, it is heavily based on the real world 2018 FIA Formula One technical regulations. Race Sim Studio were extremely successful with Formula Hybrid last year, and I have every reason to suspect that they will be once again this year with this rendition of the car. It is an amazingly sophisticated, technical, and powerful beast. Just like we had last year, and just like we have this year in real-world Formula One, we have a V6 turbocharged engine with a single turbo, and it's backed up with a tremendously powerful MGU system, a hybrid electrical system, to add some extra power boost to this car to the tune of about 160 horsepower. Combined, the internal combustion engine and the hybrid systems are producing 980 horsepower. Yeah, 980 horsepower when you've got the thing really ramped up in qualifying trim. It is tremendously powerful, and of course, when you couple it with the absolutely enormous amount of downforce that these Formula One cars have been generating since the start of last year, you have got yourself quite the performance envelope. I've still to approach really the limits of this car, just as I think I still haven't 100% approached the limits of Formula Hybrid 2017 or the Ferrari SF70H coming from the real world side of things. Really, the amount of performance potential that we have in these Formula One cars nowadays, both fictional and, of course, in reality, it is a sight to behold. One only has to look at Lewis Hamilton's pole position time from Australia, 121. In the V10 era, in 2003, 2004, a 125, a 126 was a pretty good lap time. We're going five seconds a lap faster than that in some cases. It's absolutely tremendous, the level of performance that we have now in modern open wheel racing. Anyway, though, this car being a fictional one, however, being a very good interpretation of real world restriction and regulation, it presents a very interesting design study. Just as I said last year about Formula Hybrid, this is real world engineering occurring in sim racing. So a fictional car that will never be built in reality. However, such is the fidelity of the simulation technology that we now have available just to us mere mortals, mere home PC consumers, that we're able to make some very accurate real-world conclusions based on modeling and physics work that is done here in the world of virtual reality. It is really interesting and it really is a godsend to us more technically inclined sim racers who like to see the nuts and bolts working and try to figure out drag coefficients and all kinds of crazy stuff that I know we all get up to when we are suffering through our undoubtedly sleepless nights. 
However, what have we got going on here with Formula Hybrid 2018? Well, we have got ourselves a very sophisticated, very nicely modeled 2018 spec Formula One car. Let's take a bit of a closer look at it. First of all, you will notice, those of you who are familiar with Formula Hybrid 2017, you will notice that there is quite a bit of family resemblance between that car and this one. They come from the same group, of course, and they are in sequential years relative to each other. So, of course, just like we see in real-world Formula 1, many teams have gone with evolutionary rather than revolutionary designs, and I think that evolution rather than revolution is something that can be applied here to Formula Hybrid 2018 relative to its predecessor. Looking here at the front wing, we see a very sophisticated design. Have a look at all of those flap elements in that main plane section, the cascade elements, the end plates. This thing is really polished. They spent a lot of time thinking through the geometries on this car, and then of course I, I can't even begin to fathom how many hours of modeling and texturing work went into making this single piece of the car, let alone the rest of it. However, taking a look at this front wing, of course, homologated in the real-world Formula One regulations, we have this neutral center section of the main plane. We can see just above where that banner has come up, and then moving out to the outboard size of the wing. That is where the designers can play, and that is where Race Sim Studio certainly have chosen to play. Let's see, how many flap elements do we have in that principal section of the wing here? Counting the main plane, we have one, two, three, four, five, six flap elements there just on the main section of the wing and then on the cascade element we have how many principal flaps one two three four flaps and then these turning veins flow modifiers whatever you want to call them how many of these do we have one two three four five six of those just on the cascade element it's complicated it's really complicated but have a look here at that cascade element in the black carbon there it is faultless the modeling, the texturing, it is absolutely faultless, and you can just see how complex the geometries are here. Really, hats off to these guys in terms of what they're able to achieve from their modeling side. The end plate here, really sophisticated as well. We've got that inverted U-channel just underneath where the banner has come up there. That's ubiquitous in Formula One in the real world. We've got a little flow modifier, a little dive plane if you want to call that just underneath the immersive racing decal there, heading toward the front wheel. And then we do have this little spillover, hangover element there at the top side of the end fence. Very nice detail indeed. I also like the detail of all of the stays between the principal flap elements here. You can see here looking at the right side of the wing here, left side from our perspective, all of those carbon stays there, just adding a little bit more rigidity to the wing so it doesn't fall to pieces. Very nice. The nose cone, interesting choice of nose solution here. Formula Hybrid 2017 had a pseudo thumbnail nose there. It was very similar to what we saw last year on the Toro Rosso in the real world. However, this year, Race Sim Studio have departed almost entirely from that. We now have a proper thumbnail nose on this, and you'll see the, the principal section of the center area of the nose. It is hollow. You can see this channel running through the center of the nose. This is to feed an S-duct that we'll look at in a moment that's exiting out the top of the monocoque there, just past where the nose hooks up to the car. Very nice. Of course, we have the pylons, which are attaching the front wing to the nose section proper, and they are extremely thin. It's a little difficult to see in this perspective, but you can see just how little interface there is between the main plane of the wing and the pylons that are affixing it to the nose. This is not that far-fetched. We see Formula One teams doing things like this, and I can't imagine the calculations in material strength, in shear specifically, that enable that arrangement to work, because you would think that you would want that wing to be mounted in the center of those pylons for maximum strength, but no, they get away with mounting it just there on the edge. It's amazing, the, just, the, the amount of stress that these wings are under. Remember, at top speed, they are producing several hundred pounds of downforce, well over a thousand pounds of downforce there. So very easily, in a theoretical sense, if you could manage not to crush anything, you could stand on that front wing and not break it. It's amazing what they're able to do there with the material strength of that carbon layup. Anyway, moving arrears slightly, we can see that we've got the suspension arrangement nicely modeled here, double wishbone push rod as we would be expecting in modern Formula One. 
The suspension wishbones and push rod elements have been modeled very nicely, and you can see the nice carbon texture there throughout. Quite cool, and also quite complex in its geometry. Very nicely done. Of course, we can also see the brake ducts there. Rather simplistic. They don't have any sort of webbing or meshwork in there, as we've been seeing on the Ferrari SF70H, for example, but they are nicely represented, and of course, they do their job very nicely of cooling the brakes. Moving to rear still, top side of the monocoque, we can see the outlet for the S-duct right behind that pitot tube array. So that S-duct there, it is generating a bit more downforce on the front end of the car, very nice. And then of course we get into the cockpit area. We've got canard wings there just forward of the cockpit on either side of the monocoque as we can see, just directing a little bit of air toward the radiator inlets. Now things start to get really complicated as we move down. You can see this break in the paintwork there. We have a pinkish red on the top side of the car and then we've got bare carbon on the bottom side of the car and that is where we see this really complicated barge board work. Looking underneath the car, underneath the front wing, and if we can perhaps go a little bit closer in with our free camera we can get a better look at this. Have a look at this. <laughs> this is absolutely crazy barge board geometry. Just all of them. The flick-ups and the open curves and the serrations in this carbon work. It almost looks like paper that somebody has just sliced up with a razor blade or something and made it curl like that. But no, this is carbon. And of course, it's all there to help direct air around the primary barge board elements. Absolutely ridiculous amount of detail underneath this car. I mean, this is an area that you'd never see normally, but here it is. Tremendous work. Moving arrears a little bit, we get into the principal barge board area. The first detail that I want to highlight is this very sophisticated bit of bodywork right in this section. This is a barge board. This is not a suspension element. Initially when I saw it, I thought, well, eh, that's a pretty weird looking suspension element. That's not realistic. But no, this, technically speaking, is a barge board. Have a look at that. There is not a single flat or straight surface anywhere on this carbon piece. But there it is, and it's just, you can see what it's doing with the airflow as it comes along the side of the monocoque here. It's going to start shooting it around through the principal barge boards, and some of it's going to go around the side of the Coke bottle section of the car moving arrears, and some of it's going to go there into the radiator inlet. Very, very complicated. We've morphed a little bit too far there, but you can definitely see the trajectory of the air as it's going through this section absolutely tremendous moving down through the barge board through the turning vein and then of course it's going to go through down to the side of the car into the diffuser section which of course we will talk about in due time absolutely crazy back through the barge boards now we can see the principal element of the barge board got to make sure that we don't mess up this camera too badly here we go Principal barge boards, again, very complicated designs here. It's a little bit difficult to tell where the different panels begin and end because it is carbon on carbon, but this is the primary barge board section, and you can just see the amount of care and attention to detail that RSS have taken with this. Absolutely phenomenal. The furthest most section here on the barge boards, this is the lower element of the barge board. You can see these, these shark teeth like serrations here, little vortex generators here, just trying to create areas of low pressure as it's moving down through the turning vein element here. Wow. This is just... <laughs> I'm speechless. I can't... I cannot put into words the amount of complexity that we are seeing from this car. It's just something that's otherworldly. It's absolutely crazy. Wow. Okay, let's regroup a little bit here. Moving back here outboard, we have got more conventional looking turning vanes here. Quite similar to what we've seen on the Ferrari from last year as well as this year. Of course, Red Bull and Mercedes also running a similar turning vane solution there. I'm talking about the red section of bodywork there with the little slots cut into it. That's more conventional. That's a little bit more down to earth. We can breathe again. Yes, there we go. But... Then we move toward the floor section on the rear. It's, it's, it's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. Anyway, moving toward the rear of this car, now we can start to take a look at some more detail. Wow, okay. Here's the reference plane. So this is the floor section, and it's from here that all your ride height measurements are going to be taken, things like that for legality purposes. This is the reference plane, pretty much flat, but you can see, just like in the real world, RSS are playing in this section. We can see right here these 
gills, these slots, whatever you want to call them, cut into the rear side here, moving toward the rear tires of the outboard surface of the reference plane. These are also more vortex generators. I think they're dual fold in terms of their purpose. They're trying to route air inboard toward the top side of the diffuser, and they're also trying to reduce the amount of turbulence that is created by the rotational forces of the tire. So quite interesting to see that in here. And then of course, we've got these strakes moving toward the diffuser. This is also just trying to clean up the airflow as it's heading out of the car toward the rear. Top side of the diffuser, we can see that. And of course, we can also see the rear suspension. We can get a good look at this. Double wishbone pull rod on the rear suspension on this car, just as we're expecting to see in reality. Double wishbone push rod in the front, double wishbone pull rod in the rear. True to life, 100%. RSS also did this on Formula Hybrid 2017, so status quo nowadays, but still it's a relatively new design. Pull rod suspensions in Formula 1, yes, teams have played with them throughout the past few decades, believe it or not, but now it is finally ubiquitous, at least on the rear end. Red Bull, of course, used a pull rod suspension in the, the early 2010s, 2010, actually 2009, they started to bring it out. And then when they really got their exhaust blown diffuser working well, that pull rod suspension was a critical element of its effectiveness. Anyway, we can pull out now a little bit and take a look at the rear zone of the car as a cohesive piece. Here it is. You can see the bottom side now of that diffuser, just basically a single element diffuser as we're seeing in the real world, but you can see all the strakes running from top to bottom there. How many strakes have we got? Looks like we've got six of them, at least six principal strakes there, not counting the uh, actual outboard sides of the main diffuser panel. And then moving up, we've got the suspension wishbone elements there running horizontally, the rain light and rear crash structure, and then of course the rear wing itself. Here's our exhaust outlet center pipe for the turbine exhaust and then two ancillary pipes on either side of that for your turbo wastegate exhaust there pretty much identical to what rss did last year and also this is a very similar solution to what ferrari and mercedes and renault and pretty much all the engine suppliers in formula one are using nowadays seems to be the best option for everybody on aggregate the rear wing this is also where we've got a crazy amount of detail. Have a look at the end fences on this rear wing. We've got two primary elements of the rear wing in terms of the wing surface itself. We've got a main plane, and then of course we have the, the slot gap, the flap adjust, and then of course we also have DRS, which is 100% operable. However, look at these end fences here. Just crazy. We're not seeing this complex a geometry in Formula One in the real world, however, just Look at that. All of those cuts that are in the side of that thing. It it really looks like a piece of art. I'm really not trying to be disingenuous or facetious at all. This is just complex beyond complex. Look at this. This looks like something that belongs in a museum, an art museum, a contemporary art museum. I think this rear wing end fence would be at home in a setting like that, but no, it's, it's on a race car, and yeah, it's generating downforces. It's crazy. Absolutely insane. Wow. This is just turning into a gushing session, I'm well aware, but yeah, just look at that. Complexity like we have not seen complexity yet. I could gawk at this rear wing end plate for hours. I'll spare you that, though. However, taking a look at the rear zone of the car, you can see all this bare carbon here. Of course, this is all that's left of the shark fin. This is the rear side of the engine cover. In case you can't tell, we're a little bit too close in. But this is the rear side of the engine cover. No shark fins for 2018, so this is what we're left with, a sort of pseudo shark fin. It works pretty well, and then, of course, it is rather true to life. Rear zone here, rear wing support pylons integrating the DRS actuator pod up there. And then of course, through this pylon, all of your hydraulic lines would be running to provide hydraulic pressure to the DRS actuator. We can actually actuate the DRS once I remember which button it actually is. There it is, zero. So you can see zero on the numpad, that will actuate your DRS and you can really see the detail of everything working here. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Not only does the flap open and close as you would expect, but the little armature on the actuator actually pulls it up and pushes it shut. That's really wild. That is true attention to detail. Absolutely spellbound once again. Moving toward the other side of the car now, of course you can see all of the detail that we've already talked about, but now just in shadow somewhat. You can see the very nice reflectivity of the paint 
and I do have to talk about the livery of this car. It is, of course, a fictional car, and it features a fictional livery, just like RSS did last year with Formula Hybrid 2017. However, they did not bother to include any sponsors on that car in 2017. This year, they have gone for this Wave Italy immersive racing livery. I initially saw this, and I was thinking, well, that's kind of weird. What is that? It almost looks like the old Williams logo on the side of the engine cover there, but no. Wave Italy is actually a sim racing and real-world racing consultancy based in Maranello, Italy. They do full motion-based simulators. I believe they specialize in open-wheel simulators. If you look on their website, you'll see pictures of some really good-looking motion-based simulators built around monocoques of open-wheel cars. But more interestingly, it looks like this company is looking to move into the general consumer market for PC and for sim racing. The steering wheel in this car is based on a real-world Wave Italy product. Now, I don't know if that particular wheel is available for purchase yet to the general public. If you go on their website, you see links for it. However, you don't see any prices listed. So I think they're in the process of moving into the real-world market. However, do stay tuned for that as well. Wave Italy, check their website. There will be a link in the description. However, that does solve the mystery of this livery. I had no idea what that was. Now I do. It's a real-world company. Really cool to see real-world companies in sim racing partnering up with privateer modders like Race Sim Studio because, hey, this is a fictional car, but they're turning it into real-world advertising. I had no idea what Wave Italy was. Now I do. Good job to both of those guys. Of course, we do also have to talk about the elephant in the room that I have yet to mention, Halo. 2018 Formula One, we have Halo. I am not a Halo fan, as all of you are already well aware. However, Halo is affixed to Formula Hybrid 2018. That's what reality is nowadays, for better or for worse, so that's what we have. However, we do have the option to remove Halo, both on track as well as here in showroom view. Press the number one on the numpad and the halo miraculously goes away and this car resumes having the more traditional proportions that we are used to. I've not done any running in this car yet without halo because, well, like I said, it's 2018, but you do have the option of removing halo if you so desire. Does the car look any better or worse with or without halo? Well, you be the judge on that. Personally, I prefer not to have Halo, and I think everything just looks better from a driving perspective as well as just aesthetically, but again, Halo is the state of the art at this point. I'm not using state of the art in a positive sense, but it just is the way things are. In any regard, we do have to go into the cockpit, so let's do so presently. We'll fly in here between the upper element of Halo and the side of the chassis, and here we are in the cockpit. Here is that steering wheel that I mentioned before. It is a model of the real-world Wave Italy steering wheel, which eventually I think you're going to be able to buy if you so desire. I don't know if they are also trying to manufacture a wheel motor base with it as well, or if you're going to have to figure out a way to integrate it with whatever equipment you're already running, but there it is. Anyway, in the cockpit, we're sitting a little bit low. However, this is more or less from where we'll be driving the car once we do get it out on track. Looking around through the cockpit, we can definitely see that RSS have spared no detail in here. And this is something that I find very interesting because this is a fictional car. They are under no obligation to model anything 100% because, well, there is no real world analog for us to compare this to. However, they have definitely gone in to the cockpit and they have modeled everything pretty sufficiently. Every detail in here looks very authentic and again there is no there is no real world analog here so it is what it is. You can see the steering wheel itself. The car is switched off of course for the moment but we will have a whole bunch of instrumentation on here for us to gawk at once we get out on track. The steering wheel itself modeled very nicely. We've got all sorts of switches and rotary dials here and of course all of your traditional push button effects modeled quite nicely in there. That LCD that you can see in the center that is 100% operable and it does give you pretty good information while you're out on track. Moving around Looking at the sides of the cockpit, here's the cockpit surround. This is the removable, crushable foam structure here for driver head protection. And then, of course, moving a rear so you can see the cushion at the back with the Race Sim Studio logo. Of course, that's just to keep the driver's helmet from smacking against the back of the chassis at speed. Moving up, you can see the air snorkel here. This is one of the bigger differences between Formula Hybrid 2017 and 2018. You can see the much wider snorkel now. Looks quite similar to what Ferrari and Mercedes are running in the real world in 2018. And 
I'm very happy that Race Sim Studio have decided to go that route. It just looks a whole lot better. On either side of the snorkel, you can see those camera mounts now. Very nicely integrated. They are not the traditional fins that we have seen sort of in the, the light of the T-bar that usually runs on top of the roll hoop, but they are these camera pods now, which I believe in the real world would allow for some panning capability of the cameras, either laterally or, or vertically, so interesting. And of course, we do see the teams running things like that in real life. Very cool. Looking down here, we can see some seatbelt detail. It's not bad, but it's not great either. But then again, well, <laughs> how often do you really look at the seatbelts while you're driving one of these cars? The answer is never, so who cares? Looking down here, we can see that there is some serial number there. I don't know if that's trying to be representative of anything. However, there is a serial number there. If anybody from Race Sim Studio is watching this video, please let me know what that is and why you've included that. It's an interesting detail, although I have no idea why it's there. We can see that same serial number is reiterated a couple of times as we move forward in the cockpit. Again, I don't know what that is. However, this is what this is. This is the Race Sim Studio chassis plate and we can zoom in a little bit more and we can see that it is 100% readable. There it is, Race Sim Studio chassis number blank, Formula RSS 2018. Very cool, Race Sim Studio, all rights reserved. RaceSimStudio.com, yes, that is their actual website and yes, you should actually go there right now. Anyway, we've left the cockpit now and just taking one final look at this absolutely tremendous car, it really is glorious in every sense. I can find no real fault with it right now. It is really, really, really awesome. I love this thing. I can find no fault with it, like I said. And, well, of course, we've got to go drive this thing. I'm sure many of you have already been driving this thing religiously for the last couple of days, just trying to figure out how it works. Yours truly notwithstanding. However, we have to drive this now for the second part of this review piece. We're going to do that in a moment. Stand by. Welcome to Catalunya. Before we get out on track, of course, we're going to take you through the setup screen and show you what's going on here with RSS Formula Hybrid 2018. But first off, I just want to point out how tremendously awesome this car looks now sitting in the natural sunlight in the Barcelona pit lane. I really like how all of the different flap elements of the front wing stand out with that reflectivity and that paintwork. Very nice. The car looks good and with 980 measures of horsepower underneath the bonnet, it it goes good as well. This thing is an absolutely tremendous driving experience, I do assure you. Anyway, to the setup screen, let's see what's going on. First off, the gear display. You'll notice that we've got eight ratios in the box, but each one is fixed. We cannot adjust the gearing at all, neither for the individual ratios nor for the final drive. This is a choice that RSS made in the name of simulating reality. The Formula 1 teams in 2018 cannot adjust their gearing either. They have to pick gear ratios at the start of the season and they are stuck with them through the entire balance of the championship. So what they've got is what they've got. We have got what RSS have chosen to load into this car. Tires. We have got a menagerie of tire compounds to choose from. The default is super soft. However, we have medium, soft, Super Soft, Ultra Soft, and Hyper Soft. New for 2018. We've yet to see this in real world competition. We're going to do our first run here on the Super Softs. Tire pressures. The default values are 14 PSI on the front axle and 13 PSI on the rear. They have the same range of adjustment between 10 and 18 PSI front and rear. That covers you for. Fuel, maximum fuel capacity is 142 liters, as we can see here. We'll just zero that, that out to keep the car quiet. Electronics, here's where things start to get a little bit complicated, but if you've driven Formula Hybrid 2017, the Ferrari SF70H, Ferrari SF15T, Williams FW37 from VRC, you know how this works already. MGUK delivery, this is how much electrical charge is going to be sent through the rear axle to help propel the car. Charging mode turns the deploy off and it only harvests energy from the rear axle. Balanced low is the lowest setting of your deploy, followed by balanced high, which is a little bit more kick in the pants. Overtake is full beans at full throttle, just to help you overtake a car in front. Top speed, that's full beans at full throttle in 7th and 8th gears for, well, top speed. And then hot lap, this is full beans 
all the time going for qualifying. There is one additional mode that we do have for the MGUK delivery. That's the manual deploy. If you've got a button on your steering wheel mapped to KERS, that is basically hot lap mode for as long as you're holding the button down. You release it and then it defaults back into whatever mode you've already selected. MGUK recovery. This is also a setting that affects the rear axle. You'll see 50% as the default value. However, this is how much energy is being harvested off of the rear end. This also has a pretty significant effect in your brake performance, your brake bias in particular, because it effectively is another set of brakes on the rear axle only. So depending on how aggressive you've got your recovery settings, you might have to adjust your brake bias in order to compensate. Either adjust your brake bias or adjust how much you're using the brake pedal itself. MGU-H mode, this toggles between battery and motor. This is a secondary motor generator unit, which is run off of the turbocharger. The turbocharger, obviously, that's a spinning turbine via a common shaft that is linked to a motor generator unit, basically an electric motor, which can harvest energy from the turbocharger to charge the batteries, or it can discharge that energy from the batteries through the motor and into the turbocharger to spool it up, basically eliminating turbo lag. You can choose whether or not you want that power power generated off the turbocharger to recharge the batteries or to be sent back into the turbocharger to spool it up and also send a little bit more power to the rear axle as well. Brake engine. This is your engine braking setting. It's a normal engine braking setting. Just basically it's governing how much the throttles hang open once you're off throttle to either accentuate or negate the engine braking effect that you get. Of course, in any manual car, you lift off the throttle. The throttles basically close. The engine acts as a brake. To slow you down a little bit. Same theory here. Aerodynamics, front and rear wing. Very complicated wings, but very simple adjustments on them. 24 degrees on the front and 12 degrees on the rear are your default values. You can adjust these between 1 degree and 24 degrees on the front and between 1 degree and 12 degrees on the rear. The flap angles do not visually change their angle of attack, however, the effects are duly modeled. Brakes, brake bias, 54% to the front is your default value. I find this to be a little bit too far forward, such as the weight balance in this car. I tend to ramp this down to 52% there or thereabout. Drivetrain, these are your differential adjustments in power, coast, and preload. This is pretty par for the course. Halo, we do have one visual mod on this car, and that is the option to run with or without Halo. As much as I despise the Halo, it's 2018, and, well, we're running it nowadays, so yes, we are going to run Halo, although if you do desire, you can remove it, and I do very much appreciate that RSS included that option. Suspension settings. In alignment, we have camber and tow on all four corners here, as you can see, default value shown. Dampers, this is the bound and rebound fast and slow on all four corners in your main dampers there in the suspension. Suspension dampers third, these are the first set of front and rear third spring adjustments, heave spring adjustments in bound and rebound fast and slow. Suspensions main, more conventional settings here, anti-roll bars front and rear, wheel rates and ride heights on all four corners as well. Suspensions main third springs, these are your preload settings for your third springs, your heave dampers basically, so you can choose just how much force it takes to begin compressing those heave springs. The heave springs, not as important here at Barcelona, but on other circuits that have more elevation change, like Spa or Imola, for example, these start to come into the equation. Basically, you just want to control how much the car bounds and rebounds vertically in moments of heave. That's vertical deflection relative to the ground. Pit stop strategy, par for the course in Aceto Corsa, all nominal adjustments there. Anyway, for our first run here, we're going to run completely default setup. I have not done any setup work yet in this car, so we really don't know what the ultimate level of performance is going to be. However, theoretical top speed, 360 kilometers an hour, it won't be with full wings ramped onto it like we've got right now, as you can see. But when we trim this thing out for a place like Monza, I don't doubt for a moment that we'll be hitting 360 there or thereabout. Anyway, now in the cockpit with the car brought to life, you can see the instrumentation we've got going on here on the steering wheel. First off, across the top of the steering wheel, you can see those two green lights. Those are just status lights telling you the engine's running. We will have shift lights coming up from left to right as the RPM rises. LCD in the center of the wheel. Here's where the rest of our instrumentation is. First off, on the extreme left-hand side of that LCD, you can see that green bar with ERS on top. That's the state of charge in the ERS battery. It will start to deplete as we're driving around. It will deplete from top to bottom. That's giving you a graphical representation of how much electrical power you've got left in the car. 
off to the right of that slightly, you can see the blue zero. That is our speed measuring in kilometers per hour. In the center of the steering wheel there, you can see the N, the blue N, that is our gear position indicator. N for neutral, it does go all the way up through the box into eighth gear, and then of course all the way back down through neutral and into reverse. Hopefully we won't see reverse too often here today. On the bottom left of the steering wheel, you can see L1. That's the current lap that we are running. We are on our first lap. Top right, you can see 3700. That means 3,700 RPM. That's our engine RPM. Obviously, that changes as the revs change. Below that, you can see the yellow F50. That is a representation of our fuel load in liters, 50 liters of fuel on board this car right now. Below that, you can see three blue hash marks. That will display a live delta to our previous best lap. Of course, it's all zeroed out right now because we don't have a lap turned. And then finally, on the bottom right of the steering wheel, you can see 1031 ticking by. That is our current lap time ticking away. Without further ado, let's get the clutch pulled in, first gear punched up, and get out on track here in Formula Hybrid 2018. sure our hybrid systems are turned off. Get up through the box. Into eighth gear. Downshifts are good. Gearbox is good and ready to go. It's getting out here underway through sector one. We'll start to build a little bit of temperature in the tires. And you'll start to hear the sounds of this engine. Again, 1.6 liter single turbo V6, coupled to about 160 horsepower of hybrid technology. Yeah, lots of horsepower in this thing to the tune of 980. You'll start to hear the sounds here, mostly recycled from Formula Hybrid 2017. However, most of the real world Formula One cars not sounding too much different from how they did last year in 2017, so I can excuse that for sure. DRS zone. You see on either side of the LCD, we've got two green lights up. If I open the DRS, two more green lights pop up. The first set means DRS is available. The second set means DRS is open. I gotta build some front axle temperature now in a hurry. Because we're gonna open it up now on this next lap. Obviously, we are running the current configuration here at Barcelona with the wonky Sector 3 because that's most representative of what the real-world cars are going to be doing. Balanced low on the MGU deploy. DRS open. MGUH mode into motor. We're going to start ramping up our charge rate on the rear axle now. 50% back to default value. Breaking into turn one fourth gear on the throttle. A little bit hesitation there, but we're still bringing up the temperatures. 7th gear, 275 clicks, 285, 290. Didn't need 8th gear there. Coming through turn 4. On the power, got to be careful through there. Sometimes the rear axle can pull away from you. To turn 5. Heading downhill now at the end of sector 1. Through turn 6 and 7. Now turn eight, this is a very fast corner for sure. When really up to speed, I won't be surprised if that's flat out or nearly flat out. Turn nine. 10 and 11. Turn 11's really long here. Over the crest, over the exit curves. Through 12. 13, 14. And now turn 15, final corner of the lap. This used to be almost flat out back in the V10 era before they changed sector three. Now on the manual curves deploy, you can see on either side of the LCD blue lights now down at the bottom of those column of lights. That means I'm on the button deploying the manual ERS. Turn three nearly flat. Manual ERS deploy once again, there's eighth gear. On the throttle a little bit carefully. Manual ERS deploy again. A manual ERS, you can use it basically whenever you want. Just make sure the rear axle is settled down before you get on that button. V10 
DRS open on the two DRS zones on this lap at Barcelona. Overshot the braking a little bit. Playing a little bit more with our MGU recovery to 60%. DRS open, lap time 122.096. Remember, we've got a fair bit of fuel on board. These are not the softest tires. We have got more speed in this car, surely. First thing that you're gonna notice when you get into this car, the steering, it's light. It's lighter than I initially expected, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I tend to prefer heavier steering. However, this works for some reason, and I'm not entirely sure why, but it, it feels appropriate, it really does. There is good definition from the force feedback. I can feel the bumps, I can feel the curbing. I can feel it when the tires start to chatter a little bit on either the front or the rear, which is interesting and certainly much appreciated. The more information coming to me through my eyes and through my hands, the better. That's the name of the game in sim racing. However, that lighter steering might take you a little bit of time to get used to, but it, it does feel appropriate. Again, these modern Formula One cars, they have power steering, so the steering weight in an F1 car, despite me never having driven one and very likely never to drive one. It, this feels appropriate. This feels like I think it should. If any of you have driven the IR18 and iRacing, that, that car does not have power steering and the steering there is much heavier. Of course, we're comparing apples to oranges, two very different cars and two very different sims. However, I think maybe you can see where I'm coming from there. Engine power, we've mentioned it several times already, 980 horsepower with the internal combustion engine and the hybrid systems combined. You really feel it, it does accelerate really quickly. This car, however, is a bit heavier than some of its predecessors that were also developing in the region of 1,000 horsepower toward the end of the V10 era. Those cars were weighing 605 kilograms. This car weighs 734, so it's well over 100 kilograms heavier than its similarly power endowed counterparts. You do feel that weight difference and that does rear its ugly head in terms of acceleration. This car does accelerate very quickly, but not as quickly as the old V10s did. Where this car does excel over the old V10s, downforce. This thing has biblical levels of downforce as you are probably seeing. I mean, not too many cars are able to take turn three here flat out, but this one absolutely can, and it does routinely. As you can see there, again, we are running a bit of fuel on board, so it's not quite flat yet, but when we take the fuel out in a couple of minutes, yeah, it's gonna be flat. Braking in this car, we talked about how the MGU recovery settings affect the brake balance, particularly on the rear axle, because, well, the MGUK only acts on the rear axle. Yeah, braking is good. It is a little bit touchy. Believe it or not, it's pretty easy to lock the front axle, so it might behoove you to run a little bit more of a rear bias setup, but again, watch what you're doing with your MGUK recovery settings. bit squirrely there on the back end. We caught it. Not on the throttle too soon. 122.481. Again, we're not 100% going for it, but uh, not bad lap times, but certainly we can go quite a bit faster than this.
you can see we left the pits with 50 liters of fuel. We're on lap seven. We've got 39 liters of fuel remaining. Fuel economy actually is quite good on this, all things considered. Considering the amount of horsepower it's got, considering that we're all the time running at full throttle down the straights, fuel economy is not half bad. Of course, no refueling in modern Formula One, so fuel economy, believe it or not, that does come into the equation. You can't stop for more gas. Alright, on this lap we're going to turn off the hybrid systems, we're going to recover as much energy as we can. Make sure our MGUH is in battery mode. We're now harvesting off the turbocharger even as we're accelerating. We've got no MGU deploy. And we're going to make a pit stop at the end of this lap. We're going to throw some softer tires on it. We're also going to take some fuel out, basically do a simulated qualifying run, again on default setup, but we're going to run hypersofts. We're not going to run all that much fuel on board, we're going to see where our lap time is. I'm predicting 119s, maybe 118s even, we'll see. Really see the regen rate. Our electrical power is now 100% replenished. There's our pit in. <laughs> he can't quite take that flat. pit lane. Car settles nicely at 80 kilometers an hour under the limiter. All right, let's go into the setup screen again. Let's make some changes to this setup. Let's take out some wing, first of all. Let's be conservative with taking wing out but still, we're going to take some wing out. MGUK, we're going to leave all the settings there where they are. We can adjust that on the fly. Let's take fuel out. Look at that. 50 liters, good for 27 laps. 66 laps is the Grand Prix distance around this place. How much fuel would we need for that to do it comfortably? 121 just to do the minimum distance. Of course, that's assuming going flat out the whole time, which you wouldn't be doing. You want to be comfortable for 66 laps, you run 70, 71, so 130 liters is going to be your Grand Prix distance in this car. Not too bad. Get ourselves set up for six laps here. Tires, hyper soft. Lower the tire pressures a bit. Let's do 11 PSI. I think we're set to go. All right, hybrid systems are off. Let's head on out and see what we can do in qualifying trip. I'm going to be kind to the tires here on this outlap. I'm not entirely sure how long these hypersofts will last. Obviously they're going to be quick, but being the softest compound here, they're going to be the least resilient. Tires up to temperature. All right, entering sector three. Let's start getting the car configured for some speed. MGUH is to motor. MGUK 
Okay, recovery down to 70%. And let's bring our deploy settings into hot lap here. There we go. Full beans, here we go. And manual cars deploy. And the RS. And the 8th gear. 310. 320. 330. Yeah. <laughs> this is quick. Breaking. About 80 meters before the turn in point. 4th gear on the throttle. 5th gear. Turn three, flat out. Yes, it is. Manual curve, seventh gear. Eighth gear. On the brakes, fourth gear. Third gear, holding it to the apex. On the power now. Fifth, sixth, seventh, just briefly. On the brakes in the second gear. Made a little bit of a mess of the turn in, but we get away with it. On the power, fourth, fifth, sixth. In turn six and seven. Turn eight coming up. Very nearly flat, probably going to be flat on the next lap. Bit of a lock up there on the left front, that's okay. The brake bias down a little bit. A little bit rearward. A little swirly there on the back end, we caught it. And on to power, manual curse deploy through the final corner. Sixth gear already, seventh. DRS open, eighth gear, 119.718. I said we'd make it into the 119s. We already did on our first attempt. There's more speed though. Oh yeah, look at this, totally flat, no problem. On to brakes. Fourth gear, try four through here. A little bit diminished agility on turn in there, but we're still up on our previous delta. Picking up the entrance curves, full throttle. Running almost an identical time to what we did on the previous lap so far. We messed up here last time. This time was better, not by much, but slightly. Sixth gear, almost flat. Oh yeah, this is cool. 90% MGUK recovery. To the line, what have we got? 119, 100% MGUK recovery. Let's go a little bit more forward on the brake bias now. Third gear, fourth gear, fifth, sixth. Throwing it in a little early, holding it to the apex as long as we can. It's a tenth up. Little squirreliness there. We do manage to hold it together. Oh, there's a lot of performance in this. Got the rear axle out of shape again, just a little bit. Pulling seventh gear mid corner, just past the apex. Look at that, almost two tenths up. We're out of electricity. Braking a little harder there, trying to regenerate some power for the end of the lap. We lock up the front axle a little bit. Not so bad at lower speed. Third gear. On the power, second gear for the final bit of the Mickey Mouse chicane. A little bit of over rotation on the power. Rear axle's given up. One nineteen five dead. Five liters of fuel remaining. Be our last attempt on this set of tires, I think. They're pretty much rooted. At least the rear axle, they're giving up, as I said. On the brakes. Third gear, trying to keep it down to the apex. Down by a tenth already. Yep, two tenths. Time's just falling away from us now. 
Tires are past their prime. Yep, bit of understeer setting in. Believe it or not, I know we're still running a lot of wing, but I'm thinking it might benefit us to run back at full wing. Just, yeah, the tires are giving up, but the front axle's giving up a bit too, and uh, it's happening at high speed, where the tires are less of a factor and downforce is more of a factor. We completely made a mess of that. We're going to go into the pits anyway. It doesn't really matter. Let's turn off the hybrid systems. All right, what do we need on this pit stop? We need a bit of fuel. We need Hypersofts. We can't make any wing adjustments. Let's just try one bonsai run with the current setup, and then we'll go in and we'll add a little bit more wing. thinking, believe it or not, even though we're running very close to full downforce, I'm feeling a difference. The tires probably have one really peaky lap in them, and then that's it. Of course, when we see the Hypersofts in reality, maybe that won't be reality, or maybe it is. Maybe these are basically a qualifying tire, we'll see. All right, let's think about getting the car into quali mode. MGUH to motor. MGUK to hot lap. MGUK recovery down to 60%. Manual curves, DRS open, coming down the straight now. Look at that, completely flat out, maximum power coming out of the hybrid system. We've got ourselves some serious performance in this thing. A bit of cadence braking there. Definitely need to do that in these cars. Downforce squares with speed, so as speed drops off, downforce drops off by a factor of two each time. power to the line. What have we got? 118, 921. That's good. That's really good. Back off. There is performance to be had in this thing. Yes, we have a verdict. There's a lot of power. I'm actually uh, getting myself kind of worked up here. I'm a little sweaty. One thing that I haven't really mentioned yet is Halo. And obviously we can see it, but well, you don't see me complaining about it too much. Yeah, I, it really shouldn't be there, but there it is. And it's not really hindering my visibility too badly. No more than a normal antenna would, really. It's somewhat thicker than an antenna, but uh, it's in the same location. 
your eyes are already used to sort of not looking in that area, and very rarely are you looking straight ahead in one of these cars anyway, so I don't know, it kind of works. Into the pits. Alright, not a bad second run, I must say. I head back to the pits. Our best lap time is 118.921 thus far. Bring it back up to maximum downforce. Not going to change a thing about the setup. We are just going to take a little bit more fuel out. And we're set to go. 11 PSI all around on the tires. bias there. In case you're wondering, uh, I don't always intentionally adjust the brake bias. I'm uh, using the Thrustmaster TSPC with the Ferrari F-150 wheel, and uh, I'm wearing gloves. So just the way that I hold the wheel, sometimes the, the back side of my thumb hits that thumb wheel, and uh, it's adjusting the brake bias, so just something for me to watch out for. Obviously that means I've got brake bias mapped to the thumb wheel, the left thumb wheel, to be specific, in case you've got one of these wheels yourself. All right, the wind-up for the hot lap. MGUH to motor, MGUK to hot lap. There go. DRS. Manual curs. 320, 325, 330. On the brakes at about 80 meters. Definitely feeling that we've got a bit more downforce here. Rear end's not skating as much. Already we have a gain there in Sector 1 so far. On the throttle a little bit more confidently. Two tenths up. Three tenths up. Four tenths up. Look at that. Seventh gear off the apex. Almost half a second up. On the brakes, turning it in really aggressively there. It's a Fernando Alonso style turn in. Through the chicane. Second gear for the last element. A little bit hard over the curbs, that's okay. Full power. Not as much of a gain as I would have hoped. We'll have one more lap here. DRS open, that's a 118.802. And Sector 3 kills all your momentum, it really does. This almost flat, ah man, we messed it up. You gotta go for it. <laughs> you gotta go for it, as Martin Brundle would say. And so far that's not a bad net gain there. Two tenths so far. There's more time in it. We'll do one more run on fresh tires. That's what this car is meant to do, though. It's, it's meant to be fast, and you're meant to play with it. You're meant to spend your time unwisely with this car because, well, <laughs> it's a race car. And there's a lot to be gained in a race car by investing lots of time in it. That's what it's designed for. You gotta spend hours and hours sometimes to gain 
tenths of a second. It's the name of the game. It's a, it's the law of diminishing returns, and racing is definitely the sport for demonstrating diminishing returns. Into the pits. All right, Hypersoft's going on. Tire pressures. Let's drop it to ten. All right, another six liters of fuel on board. Another five liters of fuel on board. The pit stop. We lock it up, that's okay. Again, nice pit crew animations. Off we go. For better or worse, this is our last run. Trying to be slightly kind to the tires on the outlap, but I also want to get on with it. All right, sector three. Start powering the thing up. MGUH, two motor. GUK recovery. Call it 80. MGU deploy, hot lap. Full beans. DRS. 310. 320. 325. 330. Little squirrely there, we're really pushing the limits there on that rear axle. We get the car stopped and turned in at the same time. It was worth some time. Hard over those sausage curbs. Man, there's a lot of downforce. On the power. We're in the positive direction on the Delta. That's not where I want to be. Line, what is it? It's a 118.637. Straight line speed, not that diminished, even with full downforce now. Rear end getting a little squ squirrely there. Just kept turning in the direction I wanted to turn, and the back end caught up with the front end again. We're down by three tenths already, though, in sector one. Now a half a second. Man, those tires drop off quick. You can start to get the back end out, though. Oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> Drifting it a bit at 370, no, 270 clicks. 370 clicks would be insanely fast. 270 is fast enough, thank you very much. But drifting nonetheless through turn eight. Yeah, we're a second off now. Tires are gone. How about that? Time differential of one second from one lap to the very next. Pushing the braking for all it's worth, though. Compromises us big time through the remainder of the complex, but uh, 
It's worth it. <laughs> you can break late in this thing, you really can. Half a second down through sector one. Not quite flat out in seventh. We tried. <laughs> you can't fault me for, for trying. Again, this is default setup for the most part, so there's definitely more time to be gained here with suspension tweaks and things like that, but... Whoa. <laughs> Let's go back into the pits here before I get a little bit too ahead of myself. It's been quite some time since a sim car has uh, gotten me that exasperated, I must say. it's uh, There's a lot of speed in this thing, as you can tell. There's a lot of downforce in this thing, as you can tell. It's just a completely savage animal. It really is. It don't let the, the high technology and the refined looks fool you. This thing is a killer, and it will kill you at its first, most convenient opportunity, because wow! I've got to say, uh, what is... <laughs> Just for curiosity's sake here, what is my current heart rate? Quite interesting. Alright, well, it was 92 beats per minute. It peaked at 120 there, so, you know, a a reasonably brisk walk, <laughs> 120 beats per minute. Driving this car in a Seto Corsa, 120 beats per minute. That's that's interesting. That's quite interesting. I mean, I'm a bit of a distance runner, and normally the average heart rate on a run for me will be 180 or so. But uh, yeah, so that's that's reasonable. You can call that an elevated heart rate here, just from sim racing. So interesting capability that this car has. Anyway, though, that is. Formula Hybrid 2018, brought to you by the guys at Race Sim Studio. Again, it is payware. It was $5.99 US. I believe it also went for $5.99 Euro. So you can do the currency conversion if you're not paying in US dollars or Euros, but it's not going to break your bank, but at the same time, it is going to break your brain because, whoa, this thing is quick. And, uh, yeah, I definitely believe it is faster than last year's car. And also, I certainly believe that it has the metal to compete with some other Aceto Corsa stalwarts like the Ferrari F2004, for example. Definitely going to be competitive with that car, even though it weighs 130-something kilograms more. Quite remarkable, I must say. Anyway, though, that is what we've got here from Barcelona with Formula Hybrid 2018. I will leave you with a view of some hot laps from onboard as well as external cameras so you can see how that thing looks when I really take the gloves off or, well, put them back on, you know, sim racing puns, and go for it without having to think about what to say next. But absolutely, drive this car. Go get it and drive it and drive it and drive it and drive it until your computer melts because, yeah, that's the kind of thing that this is. I do believe it's going to be popular with leagues. It's going to be popular online. Hopefully there are some lobbies that are already running with this car because it is absolutely tremendous. Once again, hats off to Race Sim Studio. You have done it now for the second year in succession. You have brought us a representative car of the current Formula One machinery, and it is just spot on. I can find no fault with it, whatever. My only criticism of the car is that it's got Halo on it, but that's not a criticism of Race Sim Studio, that's a criticism of the FIA, but so be it, that's another video for another day. Do stay tuned for the hot laps, everyone. As always, thank you all very much for your continued support, for your continued engagement, for all of your views, your likes, and of course your subscriptions. I really do enjoy making these videos for you, and hopefully you enjoy watching them. I really enjoy your feedback as well. Until next time, though, stay tuned for the hot laps. Ferrari Man 601 saying thank you very much, and we will see you soon. <laughs>